Okay, so we're diving into something I found super interesting. We always hear about how important fluoride is for healthy teeth, right? Right. But then I was reading this study about toothpaste choices in Europe. Okay. Latvia and Lithuania, to be specific. Yeah. And it just, well, it made me stop and think. Interesting. What was it that you found so interesting? Well, for starters, these countries, they have some of the highest rates of cavities globally. It is true. They do. So you'd think they'd be, you know, all about the fluoride, right? Yeah. But this study is painting a different picture. Yeah, this is a pretty fascinating study. It was a large-scale observational study. Huge. Over 5,000 people. Over 1,300 families. Which is a lot. Like, that's pretty representative, I'd say. Definitely. A large sample size. And what they found was that a surprisingly high percentage of those families are using toothpaste with little or no fluoride, particularly for their kids. Which is kind of wild when you think about it because, I mean, the World Health Organization... They list fluoride toothpaste as an essential medicine for preventing cavities. Like, the science is pretty clear on that. It is. That's the thing. It's very clear. It is interesting, isn't it, this disconnect between what we know works yeah. and what people are actually choosing. Totally. So, I mean, does this study say anything about why people are making those choices? It doesn't get into the why specifically, mm -hmm. but it does point to some broader trends that might give us some clues. Okay, like what? Well, you've got this massive marketing push towards all things natural and eco-friendly these days. Oh, yeah. And that's everywhere, not just in Europe. Oh, I know. Every time I walk down the toothpaste aisle at the store, it's like chemical-free this and natural ingredients that. I'm even susceptible to it myself, to be honest. Like, it just sounds better, you know? Oh, absolutely. We're naturally drawn to things that sound natural. We equate that with better. But it's not always the case, mm. especially in this case. And it's interesting you say that because this study actually found that a lot of these non-fluoride options, they're actually more expensive. Right. So it's not even a matter of, like, cost saving. It seems like there's something else going on. There is something else going on. And I think part of it is that the marketing is very cleverly tapping into this distrust of anything that sounds artificial or chemical, yeah. even though technically everything is made of chemicals. Sure. And then on top of that, you have this prevailing idea that natural remedies are automatically safer or gentler, which, again, that's not always the case. So are we talking about misinformation? Is that playing a role here? Potentially, I think so. The study it found that a lot of people don't even know if their toothpaste has fluoride or not. Uh, right. Which, to me, that suggests a knowledge gap. Yeah. And when you don't know and you've got all this marketing coming at you, it's hard to know. You know what's what. That's a good point. And that's where things get kind of worrying, right? Because it's not just about, you know, whether you like the taste of one toothpaste over another. Yeah. We're talking about a, a potential public health issue here. Exactly. And that's where it gets really interesting. It really is. I mean, when you think about it, you've got this lack of knowledge about fluoride. Yeah. And then on top of that, you've got all these marketing campaigns that are really good at you know appealing to our desire for natural products right. and it just all adds up it does and what's more a lot of toothpaste in europe they're not actually subject to the same kind of rigorous testing as medications wait really they don't have to like prove that they do what they say they're going to do a lot of them don't it's different for medications medications are very tightly regulated but toothpaste, in a lot of cases, it falls under the category of, like, cosmetics, mm. which means a product can claim to contain fluoride. Right. But the concentration could be completely ineffective. Oh, wow. Or even absent, and the people buying it would have no way of knowing. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about the potential consequences of this then. Yeah. I mean, if people aren't getting enough fluoride, especially kids. What can happen? Well, I mean, as this study points out, there's a very clear link between this low fluoride use and the high rates of cavities in these countries, right. which they've been dealing with for a while. Right. And you're right to be concerned about the kids because their enamel is still forming. Absolutely. They're just more vulnerable to cavities to begin with. So if they're not getting enough fluoride during those crucial years, it's... Uh, it's not good. Yeah. And that's where that lack of regulation really comes back to bite you. You've got all these parents out there who are, you know, they're dutifully brushing their kids' teeth every day, thinking they're doing everything right. Yeah. But if the toothpaste isn't up to par, 
Right. Those kids are still at risk. It makes you wonder about the long-term implications for these kids. I mean, we all know cavities are painful. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're expensive to deal with. Even here in the U.S., I mean, are we essentially setting these kids up for a lifetime of dental problems? It's a valid concern. Mm. Because it's not even just the pain and the cost of fillings, but cavities, when they're severe... They can cause real problems. Yeah. Infections, and in really bad cases, even tooth loss. Hmm. And that can have a huge impact on a child's self esteem, their overall well being. Totally. It's a much bigger problem than just a cavity. So, what can we do? Is there a way to turn this tide? I think so. I mean, yeah. knowledge is power, right? We right. need to make sure people have access to accurate information about fluoride. Okay. And I don't just mean dry scientific facts. We've got to make this stuff relatable. We've got to make it engaging. Like busting myths about fluoride. Because I feel like I've heard a lot of kind of scary things over the years that maybe aren't even true. Exactly. Like fluorosis. Yeah. Which people might not know. It's just a cosmetic condition. Right. Cause like white spots on the teeth. Yeah. But it's usually pretty mild. And it really only happens if you have way too much fluoride exposure when you're really little. Okay. So the key is just use the right amount for the age. Right. So it's all about finding that balance. Exactly. And making sure people have all the information so they can make an informed choice. Exactly. The risks and the benefits. It's tricky, though, right? Like, how do you find that balance? It's easy to get caught up in, like, all the fear mongering you see online. Right, yeah. Or even just the marketing hype. And yeah. it's like, at the end of the day, you just need good information. You do. You need good, solid facts. Yeah. And when it comes to fluoride, I mean, the evidence is pretty clear. Right. It's safe. Yeah. It's effective. It prevents cavities. Right. Especially for kids. Okay. So then how do we get that message out there in a way that actually like resonates with people? I mean, we've talked about this, how effective the marketing is. Right. How do you compete with these like flashy campaigns when what you're trying to promote is like science? Right. Well, I think it starts with meeting people where they are. So instead of just, you know, standing on a soapbox and talking about how great fluoride is, yeah. we need to listen to what people are actually concerned about. They answer their questions. We have to be upfront about the fact that, look, there are potential risks with anything. Right. But with fluoride, those risks are really, really tiny yeah. if you're using it the right way. Right. It's about building trust, like you were saying. Exactly. And acknowledging that people are coming to this from different places. They have different experiences, different levels of knowledge. Absolutely. Maybe some pre-existing biases. Mm -hmm. And that's where I feel like, you know, dentists and other healthcare providers, they have such a big role to play. They do. Because imagine if, like, every dental checkup yeah. included a conversation about fluoride. Mm. Where it wasn't just like, hey, use fluoride. Right. But it was actually explaining like, okay, this is how this works. Right. This is why it's important. Exactly. Empowering those patients. Exactly. And maybe even addressing some of those marketing claims directly. Absolutely. Yeah. Because not everybody has the time to go and do a deep dive on every single ingredient in their toothpaste. Sure. Right? We need to make it easier for people to find good information that they can trust. This has been a really interesting deep dive. I have to say, I never thought I would be so fascinated by toothpaste. It's fascinating, isn't it? It really is. But it just goes to show you how even these choices that seem kind of small, kind of mundane, mm -hmm. they can have a big impact. They can. And what I find so interesting about this is it makes you wonder, okay, if this is happening with toothpaste, what else is going on? Right. What other choices are we making based on, you know, marketing or misinformation yeah instead of looking at the evidence it's a little bit scary when you think about it it is a little bit but hopefully by you know talking about these things and encouraging people to like think critically right we can at least try to like arm people with the information they need to make good choices exactly. for themselves and their families i agree so there you have it a deep dive into the surprising world of non-fluoride toothpaste use in Europe. Um, I know. Sure. We talked about the trends. We talked about what the potential consequences are. And most importantly, we talked about what you can do yeah. to make informed choices about your oral health. Absolutely. And remember, knowledge is power.